Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Art of Space Engineering, a podcast which aims to explore the details behind how spacecraft and various payloads come together before launch and the lessons learned along the way. I'm your host, Sarah Rogers, and today's episode is going to cover a spacecraft that's a little bit different from what I usually cover on this podcast, which is being developed by a little company called SpaceX. The Dragon capsule made history in spaceflight last summer as the first spacecraft developed by a private company to take astronauts to the International Space Station, and it did all of this from U.S. soil, which has not happened since 2011 when the space shuttle program came to an end. In addition to this milestone, you'll also see it carrying cargo to the International Space Station several times a year. Now, there's a lot of really great engineering that goes into the Dragon, but today we are just going to focus on one aspect of the design, which is, drumroll please, the avionic systems. Avionic systems are various electronic components on a spacecraft that can control everything that it does. Now, because of that, these can refer to a lot of things, navigation systems, communication systems, electrical power systems, etc. This episode will feature the power system side of the avionics world and what goes into developing these for the Dragon capsule. My interview victim for this episode is Kate Hendricks, who worked at SpaceX for eight years and saw the early days of the company. Since then, she's worked at Astronus, which develops geostationary communication satellites and now works at Luminar, which is developing state-of-the-art LiDAR and perception technology to make autonomous vehicles safer. Her career path has given her some great experiences in quite a few different areas, which we got to dive into a little bit in this episode. I met Kate through a mutual friend when we were shooting around some thoughts on CubeSats, so this ended up being our first time talking about spacecraft not via Slack, (laughs) which was pretty fun. In addition to working on avionics, we got to dive into a little bit of SpaceX's history, lessons learned over the years, and how working with spacecraft like Dragon is a lot different from working with satellites which have to stay in a designed orbit. Now, before we get into this topic, I do want to note that because the design is proprietary to SpaceX, this episode won't actually reveal any hidden secrets behind the design, but there is still quite a bit that we could chat about based on what information has been made publicly available. Also, this episode was actually recorded like a while back, so in the beginning there are actually a few references to her old name, but she felt that it was okay to leave it in the episode, so I just wanted to quickly point it out so there wasn't any confusion there. That being said, there is a lot of really great content here. I certainly enjoyed recording it, so I hope you guys enjoy listening to this interview. So on that note, let's get right into it. Hello. Hello. I don't know if it if it helps to see someone face to face. <laughs> More interesting than looking at a blank screen for an hour or so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of start zoning out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for doing this. And it's it's nice to to get to talk to you. Well, I guess virtually, uh, virtually face to face instead of like through Slack, um, and kind of meet you uh, more more in person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since we've only like talked over Slack, how do you pronounce your name? Is it Baird? Baird? Yeah, okay. One syllable. Because I was I, I was thinking ba- Baird, and I was like, nah, I'm just gonna screw that up. Uh, and that's super he's gonna be like, I'm not gonna do this podcast. I'm like, like super used to people not getting my name right, so it's it's totally fine. <laughs> I have like I, I just okay. go to Starbucks every time, and it's like Baird. I'm like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> oh, you don't have like a Starbucks name? Uh, I found my Barry a few times, um, mostly okay. out of people not hearing my name right the first time, and I go, "Yeah, that's that's it. You got it." <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Sarah is like the one of the. Well, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, okay. So, but let's let's just top right into yes, it then. Sure. So. Um, you've, you've got a really awesome background. You've worked at a, like a mixture of places. So, um, I, I thought let's, you know, just start this off by getting to know a little bit more about you and talking about your background, where you work now and kind of what, what got you. Yeah, there. sure. I'll just, um, I'll start from when I got out of college, I guess, cause that's, that seems to be the most pertinent. Um, actually when I was in college, um, I did an internship at a semiconductor company, which was really nice. Um, I think, um, so basically I started out, um, 
so before college, I wanted to be a computer science computer scientist programmer, and then I realized I hate computers. Um, so I decided uh, I I done electronics as a kid a little bit. I had some of those like two hundred one electronic kits and stuff, and just kind of learned oh, over no. time. Um, so I was like, okay, well, let me try that as a career option and go to electrical engineering. And if I don't like that, then I'll find something else that I like. Um, but I ended up really liking it. So um, I took my first couple of courses, which were all just sort of like basic lab in electronic courses, and they're all pretty nice. And then it turns out I, 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 I was thinking I didn't have the math background to but then I, like, I actually got into it and I really enjoyed it. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. And uh, I yeah, did pretty well there. Um, I went to Analog Devices as my co-op, um, which was pretty fun. Um, so they have a, a location in North Carolina, which is where I went to school. I went to NC State. Um, and uh, in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, they have a office where they do high-speed digital converters. Um, so that was, I kind of cut my teeth on uh, electronic design there um, as applications uh, engineer intern, essentially. Um, and then uh, after college, um, I graduated right when the, two, when the 2008 recession was just in full swing. Um, it was 2009. Oh, no. um, and unfortunately, um, Analog Devices, the company I was working for, um, they didn't have enough money in their budget to pay me to start in the group they wanted me to start in. Um, so I was kind of like scrambling a little bit, trying to find something else to do. Um, I kind of took it as an opportunity to say, okay, well, what do I, you know, what would I do otherwise? Because I'd been kind of planning on that for a while. Um, and, you know, a couple of like, you know, I thought, I guess I had some like more exotic ideas, like, oh, maybe I could work for CERN and go to Europe or something like that. Um, and then uh, some friends of mine were talking about this startup called SpaceX. They had just had a, a third launch. It was actually the, the failed launch where the second and first stage collided. Um, and uh, they were having this really awesome conversation in the car about it. And I was like, oh, what are you guys talking about? You know, they gave me the skinny on it. Um, read their blog, which was super fascinating, um, and then applied. Um, and they were actually one of the few companies to call me back. <laughs> <laughs> they were actually desperate for people at that point, where everyone else was kind of like yeah. to have money for people. So uh, it worked out very well, actually. It was um, it was very risky at the time because they were such a small mm -hmm. company and there was no, like, you know, it was basically one of those things where it was like, okay, this is just a bunch of crazy people doing crazy things. Like, <laughs> you know, this is probably not going to go anywhere, but, you know, worst comes to worst, I move back in with my parents and find something else I want to do. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I figured, take the risk, why not? <laughs> So that was that was going into SpaceX. In SpaceX, um, mm -hmm. I started as a test engineer there. Actually, I started as a um, they they called a boot camp program where they put you in different you know, rotation along different departments. Um, they don't have that program anymore, unfortunately. Which is it was a really nice program when they had it. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, I got to know a bunch of people really well through that program. Um, but anyways, they. Uh, they made me a test engineer first, and then they actually kept me as a test engineer because they really needed me to, to work on stuff there. Um, and then after a few years, um, I went to one of the design groups and said, would you, you know, please let me, please, 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 please let me work for you? And they said yes. Um, so I worked as a design engineer for about two to four years, and then uh, it's a little hazy when, when everything happens, so forgive me if my years are not are wrong, but. Um, I ended up becoming a senior design engineer after that. Um, so I went from being the youngest guy in my group to the oldest, quote unquote, guy in my group. Um, and then uh, ended up leaving the company after eight years. Um, did a brief stint as a flight safety engineer as well, which was uh, really fun. Um, fun, quote unquote. Um, and uh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, oh, we can go into that, into that story, actually. That's a, it's a really nice okay. story. Um, and then uh, after that, um, my wife moved to San Francisco. Um, she wanted to start a job up there. Um, she got out of school, basically, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going with you. So we went to San Francisco. I got a job at Astronis, stayed there for about a year, uh, and then went to another um, automotive company after a year of that. Um, basically, kind of just decided I needed a break from startups. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this was a more established automotive startup. So um, it was a little bit, it was a little bit more low key to work for them, which is what I needed. And then I had a kid. Um, and uh, that ended up being very hectic and uh, needed 
needed that. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of, I don't quite know how to describe it. Like they needed a little bit of um, less intense work for about a year mm -hmm. or two. And that's, that's what they provided me, which has been great. Um, not to say it's not intense, it's just less intense than say SpaceX or something like that. Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, it makes sense that like uh, startups are, are fairly hectic, but I, I guess I, I didn't know how hectic they, I, have, I don't know a whole lot about like how startups kind of are organized and how they actually work out. So that's interesting. Startups tend to be a very different experience. Um, it's, I, I, you know, it's funny, I'm saying that I'm like, I haven't really worked for a bigger company than SpaceX, which is at its biggest about 7,000 employees. Mm -hmm. It's a big company, but it's not as big as some other companies out there like, you know, Boeing or so forth. Um, and they're, um, I would say that the startup experience is definitely more hectic. Like you're, you're expected to carry a lot of weight and you're expected That's to fair. do a lot more things. Okay. Um, you, you have to be much more of a generalist in a startup uh, environment um, and be able to jump between different projects and, you know, all the various different things that people want you to do. Um, and uh, I found um, early SpaceX, I think, was like they were at the tail end of being a startup at that point, right before the Falcon 9 first launch was when I joined. Um, and that was kind of the end of the Wild West, so to speak. Um, and I would say the real end of the Wild West was when they did the docking with uh, ISS. But, um, and then after that, uh, Astronis was very much a startup too. I think when I joined them, they were actually in a condo um, in uh, San Francisco. Um, like a, like a two-story loft apartment, essentially. <laughs> um, and they had everyone cramped in there. Oh, wow. Um, and then they eventually got a, they got yeah, they got a nicer office uh, by the time I left. Um, and it, I mean, it was, it, you know, I enjoyed Astronis. It was, a, it was a great company. It just wasn't right for me at the time. So, so were they uh, were they just like developing CubeSats in, uh, you know, on a, on a bench in this kind of two story condo or? Yeah, they actually did. They had um, they they just they just gotten their one CubeSat about to launch, and they launched it right after I joined. Um, and they had the flat sat in the uh, in the apartment um condo building oh, that's and cool. it was just like it was all on a table yeah it was it was it was it was wild to see because i was like used to like oh you know this is like a super protected environment and so forth. we're just like you know, on a table and like <laughs> next to a guy's like computer but it was still you know it's still really cool to see and it was like they're definitely doing all the processes that you know a traditional aerospace would it just looks different so <laughs> <laughs> um so kind of circling back to your, your work at spacex when you were a design engineer, were you working on, because I know like the, I mean, there's different electronics for different parts of the rocket. So were you working yeah. on one part in particular? Did you kind of get to jump around and work on um, several different things over during the Yeah, um, that was actually, I had a kind of an interesting history there. Um, there were a couple of different electronic departments at SpaceX. Um, I would say there were three main ones, one, um, there's more now and it's actually changed around a lot now, but back then there was like your RF team, um, which was purely doing the radio frequency mm -hmm. uh, links. Then there was the power team, which was doing the electrical power system, um, batteries and solar panels and what have you. Um, and then there was the, um, what they called the Rio team, which was essentially everything else. Um, <laughs> they were doing like the computers and the, um, the controllers and, you know, every, all the actuators and sensors and so forth. Um, I actually ended up joining the power team um, because I actually, you know, I hit it off well with the manager and liked those guys a lot mm -hmm. and I uh, joined them. Um, and there was, um, it, it, SpaceX was a big company. Um, well, okay. They were a company flush with cash and had a lot of resources. Okay. And so what tended to happen was there would be all these little like, you know, power team does it their way and Rio team does it their way and RF team does it their way and everyone else does, does it their way. And there was not, there, there was some mixing and matching, but um, there's also, there's often a lot of competition between the teams as well mm -hmm. to try to like build the better mousetrap, if you will. Um, and for me, I found the, the power team tended to have very simple designs, very um, easy to work with designs essentially and they ended up being um, uh, a great team to work with uh, especially because we got to 
you know, we, for the space, okay, so I guess we can go into a little bit of detail. There, there was the rocket and the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. um, the rocket's very simple in power systems. It's, it's just a battery, essentially. And there's a, also a power distribution box, which is, uh, if you think of it like a circuit breaker panel, you're not too far off. Um, and then there's the, the spacecraft itself, which has the same two things. It has a battery and a like, power distribution system as well, but it also has solar panels. It also has, um, you know, all these big actuators and there's all these things you, um, there's, it's a much more sophisticated design mm -hmm. for a power system there. Um, so most of my job working for them was actually working on the spacecraft. Um, we did very little work on the rocket. Um, towards the end of my career at SpaceX, I did uh, flight safety, which was purely on the rocket. Um, no one cared about the spacecraft being safe, so. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not true. They, they, people cared a lot. That don't, yeah. <laughs> don't take my word. No, people cared a lot about making that thing safe. But it wasn't. There wasn't a quote unquote flight safety system on that guy. So, hmm. so like the actual spacecraft. This isn't like the customer's spacecraft, or is it? Um... So when I'm making that distinction, I, I guess I can use the program name. So um, the, the rocket's Falcon, and the Dragon is the spacecraft. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, so that was. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah, so when I say spacecraft, I mean Dragon, okay. basically. And there was actually different iterations of Dragon. So there's like Dragon 1, and then there was like a Dragon upgrade, mm -hmm. which was Dragon 2, and a, a C2 rather. And then there was the um, uh, Crew Dragon uh, after that, which is a totally different vehicle, so essentially. In working on all of those like de design iterations, did the, the power system evolve a lot over the course of while you were there? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I think actually what, what I saw happen was there was definitely an evolution of like people learning things as we moved along between the different programs. When I first started out, um, there was like the Falcon 9 systems. There, were, there had been a Falcon 1 system and everyone agreed that thing was terrible and no one was going to use it. So we were going to use this Falcon 9 system. Um, and then as we built that, we learned that was terrible and no one wanted to use it. So we built um, a new system. Well, we built, Dragon 1 was built off the Falcon 9 avionics, essentially. It shared a lot in common with that. Uh, Dragon C2 was a complete redesign. Okay. Um, and that one was um, essentially kind of designed from the ground up to be close to what you would need to do human spaceflight with. It. Um, it wasn't exactly what you needed, but it was it was pretty close. Um, it's at least in terms of what the avionics system could do. Um, and then uh, what we did was we took lessons learned from that, and put that back into the rocket. And that became Falcon, uh, at least for the avionics system. That was Falcon one point one. That was a complete redesign of the avionics system to look more like the Dragon systems. Um, and then when we did Crew Dragon, we uh, well, okay, we actually did another iteration of the Dragon systems after that. That was I think. Dragon, I don't remember the mission numbers now. It was like the fifth flight of the Dragon or so is when we incorporated those in. That was one of the first systems I worked on um, as a design engineer, came in that one. Uh, and then the Crew Dragon was a complete redesign from there even. Uh, and that was that was actually a ground up redesign. That was like, we, we started from a blank piece of paper, um, which was really awesome to see actually. That was that was some of the most fun I've had in my career is oh, that's cool. doing the, the system designs from the Crew Dragon, so. Cool. How uh, I don't know if you can can go to and in, into detail on it, but how can I ask how they evolved over time? Like uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so I'll I'll go into um, my NDA is expired, so hopefully I can go into <laughs> some detail. And there's actually a lot of public information out there as well. Um, so I don't think I'm saying anything that's super not known. Um, but in any case, um, Falcon Nine. Um, one was, there's a book, there's an excellent book by, um, Mr. Brooks, it's called The Ma Mythical Man Month, it's about software process management, essentially, and he has this, uh, he has this great chapter in there, actually, called The, Sin the Second System Effect. The idea there is everyone builds one system, decides that thing is the worst thing in the world, and they're going <laughs> to do it again, and they're going to make it better, and faster, and stronger and everything. And that's what Falcon 9 1 was. It was like, okay, we, we cut our teeth on Falcon 1. We know what we're doing now. We're going to do a, a better system. And it ended up being a little bit too much. Okay. Um, so it was a very complicated system. Um, and actually, the way it was designed for Falcon 9, Elon had kind of a mandate that the system be ready for human spaceflight. So 
everything was designed such that it was like, you know, super redundant, super fault tolerant, like you had to take a, a bolt or a meteor to the side of the spacecraft in order for it to like shut down some of the avionic systems. And uh, it ended up actually being a little, it ended up being way overkill for what it was. Um, the, and it was very expensive. It was unsustainably expensive to that. Um, and uh, it wasn't even, um, I think, I'm pretty sure, yeah, this is public knowledge. Um, there, all, the older computers for Falcon 9 were not triple string. Um, they were designed to be triple string, but we couldn't make the software work in time. So we ended up doing a uh, single string system on the original Falcon 9s, which were, I think, the first five flights. It was whenever the 1.1 kicked in, it's when it became actually triple modular redundant. Um, once, and, then, and that was actually the same systems we had on, on Dragon, um, so similar computer systems and so forth. Um, and that was because we had to get it working for Dragon. We could not get that to work. So we <laughs> anyways, um, so that was, that was the, probably the biggest evolution I saw was just going from, oh, we're going to make this system from the ground up as good as we can to, oh, how can we improve on this and make this actually sustainable for launching a lot of rockets, which by, there were already discussions by that point, the point that the 1.1 project came along, um, that we were going to do, you know, a lot of rockets a year, like over 10. Um, <laughs> it ends up that's, that's come true. Yeah. At the time we were all kind of like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but it did. Yeah. Um, and, but we designed it to, to work with that actually. Um, so there's all sorts of, um, uh, things like the engine controllers are um, themselves, you know, they're fault tolerant to a degree, but they're not as fault tolerant as the original Falcon 9 engine controllers were because they don't need to be so expensive. Um, you, you only have one. You can actually have some redundancy at the system level because you have nine engines on the rocket. Um, so there's there are some exercises like that to try to figure out, like, you know, what, where can we make things a little bit cheaper, a little bit more effective to produce um, not necessarily cheaper as in like money, but also cheaper as in like not take so much labor right. and not be complete pain to install and things like that. Um, and that, that helped a lot actually. That drew a lot of the things we were doing at SpaceX was, um, how do we make this work, but not, you know, be so complicated. It's going to be a pain to build this thing over and over again. Um, one example I can use is mechanically, um, the, the avionics boxes in the original Falcon 9s were all cast steel. And the idea there was that would be cheaper than like the machined aluminum we were using before on, I guess, Falcon 1. Um, that was a little bit before my time. But what I, what I saw happen was that oh, um, when they tried to build these boxes, because they were cast steel, they couldn't keep the tolerances right. So you had to like put you know, more washers on them in order to take up that tolerance mm -hmm. stack up. And so it ended up being every box was a little bit different than the other boxes. Um, and it took a lot of manual labor to make these things. And um, there was a lot of, uh, the other thing too is it was based on some satellite systems. So it was a stack of circuit boards. So you would like have one circuit board on the bottom, then a stack on top of that, a stack on top of that, a stack on top of that, which meant that every time there was a problem with one of the circuit boards, you had to take the whole thing apart. And if it was like the bottom circuit board, you had to take every single circuit board out of the thing to get to it. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, it's great if you're worried about space efficiency, but in something like a rocket, you're not actually that concerned about space efficiency for an avionics system. Um, for a spacecraft, you, you, it's a bigger problem than for a satellite. It's, it's, that's, that's where you start to do those things. But at the time, we didn't really, you know, I guess – we didn't really know that institutionally, and it was some of the lessons learned we had was, oh, if you make things simpler and easier to work with and maintain, it gets cheaper. Um, you don't need as many people. You don't need as complicated of a process. Um, and you can actually guarantee that they're going to work a lot better when okay. you can do things like swap the circuit boards out easily. <laughs> um, so that was, that was a lesson. Um, and uh, we, we actually saw that in the Dragon two um, C2 systems, and then um, the follow-on Dragon systems and the Falcon 1.1 systems, those were all sort of uh, traditional backplane card card in a slot system. So you'd like, take off a back cover and there'd be all the cards available, you just take out the one you need. Um, the only one that was a pain in the butt to take out was the backplane, um, because every card was connected to it. But there was nothing, the backplane was um, passive. There was, uh, it was just a wiring 
uh, loom essentially, although it was a planned circuit board. So, okay. Yeah. So that was no. I mean, that's an example of, of how the systems evolved a little bit. It was just sort of institutional knowledge of of what you're doing for each of the missions that we were doing, and then taking that and following on with it to improve everything essentially. Mm -hmm. um, it was sort of a relentless drive to making the best system you can um, at SpaceX. Uh, and I think there still is to a large degree. Um, it's, it's gone through a few generations of engineers there now, but it's it very much is still a drive to like get it as better, faster, cheaper as you can. So. Yeah, that's definitely, that's one of the things that I, I think I, one of the things that I admire about SpaceX is, is the drive to kind of just constantly improve and, and just do things yeah. that no one's ever seen before. So that's really cool. Yeah, and it's, it's easy to do that when you have a pipeline set up to do it with and you can continually improve things. Like you have the same design engineers working on it generation after generation. Um, yeah. that was, I think it was kind of funny that we were having, even though we were this little like startup company, I mean, some of us that, you know, back then we had 10 launches under our belt and that was like more than people with Boeing had had, you know, decades <laughs> so it was uh it was it was definitely it was interesting to see that flip around really quickly from us being the scrappy little startup to oh now we, we're the ones who know what we're doing so mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of yeah I, definitely I, I don't claim to know what I'm doing but. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I think you do um one thing I was I'm curious to ask about so like I mean spacecraft have a lot of fault protection built into their their battery systems um, is spacecraft uh, battery systems like taken to a more extreme level just because of their missions and what they actually have to do versus yeah <laughs> gotcha um i would say so i can't get into this is one of the areas i know and i can't oh, okay. um i know that um one of the, so spacecraft batteries have kind of gone through a bit of an evolution recently um what's happened is that back in the you know back in the 60s when they first did the or you know when the crash programs in the u.s were happening um the bat that's when battery technology sort of got into rockets the first time um and they did a lot of things like primary cells so you would like have a battery where you pull the tab and then the battery starts um mm -hmm. and it's never going to you never recharge it it's it's just you once you're done you're done um those are actually very common on spacecraft up until relatively recently. Um, what happened was that uh, there went through several generations of rechargeable batteries. Um, lead acids were always a little bit too uh, cumbersome to use on a uh, on a rocket um, or a uh, or a spacecraft for that matter because the vibration just kills them. Um, yeah. There are some lead acid batteries that work well for that, um, but they're not. Generally, it's very difficult to do that, especially a wet uh, lead acid battery like what's in your car. That's just not going to go in, in the vehicle. Um, but NICADs were getting a little bit better, uh, and then NIMH batteries got a little better, and then lithium ion came. And I think what happened was people saw that lithium ion, it, it sometimes, I can't remember the exact number, it's, it's an order of magnitude better energy density than previous rechargeable batteries, essentially. Um, and because of that, there's now, oh, we can and should use lithium ion and that's happened in the rest of the space industry as well um, they, they're replacing a lot of the iss batteries with lithium ion batteries now as they need to replace them um and a lot of other even older aerospace companies are going to lithium polymer or lithium ion which are the same chemistry more or less um, somebody's probably gonna take issue with that but they're, they're similar chemistries um they uh what happened so fault tolerance in batteries is actually very interesting um, because oh, there's uh, there's been a lot of sort of in the aerospace community um, incidents that have happened with lithium ion batteries uh, in particular. Lithium ion batteries, their energy density is very good, but they're also inherently a lot more unstable because there is more energy there. Um, and I'd say they're sort of newer technology, so they're still kind of working some of the kinks out. One of the kinks being is they catch fire very um, <laughs> Did you and, see someone uh, catch fire? Yeah, um, lithium ion batteries <laughs> are very notorious for this actually. Um, there's mm -hmm. been a couple of air crashes that have happened. Um, one which uh, was just lithium cells sitting in an aircraft cargo hold um, caught fire. 
um, took the aircraft down. Um, there's a couple of other, and that's actually one of the reasons why you have to be careful about like kicking lithium ion batteries on planes is because they have a lot of energy density to them. And if you look up like Dell laptop battery explosion or things like that, you'll see like, there's not really explosions. They're more just sort of like thermal runaway events is what mm -hmm. I would call them. Um, okay. they basically fire shoots out from them and it's like, oh, that's not good. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, that happened with the Samsung, uh, Note 8, I think is what it was. It was one of the new generation phones. Um, they uh, they had a lot of problems with the battery in that phone because they had internal cell shorting in there. So anyways, the aerospace community, they had a similar incident, which was the Boeing 787. Um, that when that guy came uh, out, one of the first things that happened to it was one of the batteries went to run away. Um, mm -hmm. We actually had this big exchange in, in SpaceX between a couple of the engineers, we were kind of talking about it and looking at it, and we we're all like reading the NTSB reports because they were going into detail about what the battery design was like, and we were seeing it. And we actually realized some of the things that were happening in there. Um, there I mean, there's, I don't want to bash the Boeing engineers because I know there's a ton of constraints that went into this, and people have put their lives, efforts into making these batteries safe, and then they go into the field and they don't work or they have problems and that's that's not good um but we are looking at it and we're going oh there's actually some problems at a system level here like you could see the batteries were they were big prismatic batteries um so let me, let me back up a second. so there's in in the lithium-ion world there's a couple of different types of batteries so cylindrical which is the traditional lithium-ion battery that, that looks kind of like a, a bigger d-cell battery if you will um they're actually called um there's a couple of different form factors for them. The most common is called the 18650, which is 18 millimeters, six, 65 millimeter tall, um, 65 centimeter tall. Uh, anyway, um, that one's very common in laptops uh, and also very famously was used in the Tesla Roadster. Um, I think they use a different form factor for the, the new models coming out now, but it's it was used for the, the Roadster and I think the Model S as well. Um, and then the uh, for the spacecraft though, um, they tended to use, or for aerospace applications, they use what's called, they tend to use what's called prismatic cells. Um, what these are, are they build the cell in like, uh, in, in literally in a prism, in a, in a uh, rectangle, a rectangular box, if you will. Um, and they, what they do is, if you look at, this is getting really technical now, if you look at the inside of a liquid ion <laughs> battery, um, what it actually is, is it's actually a cathode and an anode kind of sandwiched on each other. Uh, and there's electrolyte placed in the middle of it. Uh, very, very simplified explanation, but you know, get you this done. But what they do is they, uh, they they roll this out and then they roll it up on itself. And that's actually why you have cylindrical cells are most common is because it's easiest to do. You roll it up on itself, you get what's called a jelly roll. Uh, you put that in a, in a cell and you're, you're good. Um, for a prismatic cell, instead you build it to where it comes out in more of a, a rectangular sh shape. And the, usually those are kind of custom order batteries. So what happens is you end up getting really high um, power density or energy densities in these battery cells. Because what you're doing is instead of like hooking up a bunch of battery cells together to get your energy density, uh, you end up saying, make me a battery that has this energy density that's like in one thing. You, the pro of that is you get a lot of energy density in the battery. The con of that is that when that battery, if the, something goes wrong with that battery, um, it's it's gonna go. Uh, it's it's actually a very similar problem what they have with like nuke reactors. Like the bigger the reactor is, the uh, the bigger the problems that it's gonna have. Um, so when these big batteries have problems, um, the, we saw this with like the Fisher Karma, for instance. Um, that was uh, I think a, an A one two three battery. I, I'm pretty sure that's a prismatic battery. It was the one that was in the Fisher Karma that, that blew. Um, and then the 787 was a prismatic as well. Um, and what they had was they had cell vents that were kind of like facing her out. So like if the battery has a thermal runaway problem, it has a vent that it can, you know, the fire can shoot out the back of it. Um, the problem is when the 787, they had the vents kind of pointed at each other because they were anticipating that these batteries were you know, sufficiently quality controlled that they wouldn't have to worry about what happened if they vented. Um, and that was actually very different than the way we were doing it at SpaceX. At SpaceX, we were very concerned about what happens if the battery doesn't go right away. How do we make it safe? Um, and unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail about how we did that. Um, we can 
I'm going to hear about how some other people in the industry do it. Um, but essentially, uh, what you try to make it do, what you try to do is you look at what's called a small cell uh, setup instead, where you go back to like, oh, okay, we just string a bunch of cells together. Now we can make it to where one of those cells can literally catch fire and explode, but none of the other ones around it can. And how do you do that is, is a big question. Um, one common way to do that, and this is the way that they did it at Tesla, um, way back when, um, this was written about Elon's uh, biography actually, um, they would work on a system where they would have thermal, like the cell thermal mass could absorb uh, one battery going into a runaway, um, but it wouldn't cause the other batteries around it to go into a runaway. And that was actually a pretty critical safety feature. Um, and there's other things you do as well. So like, you know, one battery events, you have um, burst disks so that it can burst outside and not blow everything else up. And if the battery, if the battery goes into a complete runaway, then you have, um, you duck that uh, out. And that's actually what they do. This is what they do for the 787 after they, they found the battery problems is they put a duct on there so that if there was a fire again, it wouldn't go into the uh, avionics hole, it would go out of the plane. Um, that was one of the, the upgrades they made to it. Um, okay. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, I, that's a, a very brief overview of fault tolerances in battery systems in space. And I say that SpaceX um, was definitely on the cutting edge of what you can do with batteries safely. Um, we had a very involved battery program there, uh, which was pretty cool to see. So I can speak to that being a power systems engineer. So. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Um, did you guys have to get anything certified as as well at each time that you oh, uh, each time yeah. that you worked on it? Because I know, like, so for for CubeSats for um, for Phoenix, the, the CubeSat that I worked on. So we had lithium ion battery cells, yeah. and before we would. Um, and we were being deployed from the ISS. So, I mean, there's, there's people on there and they, you know, they took, they made sure that they took extra precautionary mm -hmm. measures in order to, to make sure that they had verified and, and, and had documentation to say, you know, this is, uh, this has been tested and it's going to be safe if it's sent to the ISS with people. Yeah. So we had our, our vendors had to do some additional uh, testing on our flight batteries and then send us that, those reports uh, before we were ever integrated and then went to the ISS. So do you, do you guys have similar stuff too? Yeah, it was very similar stuff for, for us as well. Um, I remember too, because of the size of the packs we were making, um, the uh, we had to meet DOT specifications. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to ship the batteries around the country, um, they had to meet strict specifications for being safe enough to ship around the country without blowing up in some someone's plane. Um, or you would make it ground only. You would put a big sign on it that says, do not put me in a plane, and you would ship it around my truck or something. Um, so there was definitely some of that. And then also for um, flight, uh, let me back up a second. Yeah, for the spacecraft in particular, there was, um, especially the crew spacecraft, there was a lot of safety measures put into place to make sure that things didn't go wrong. So I'll give you a, an example. Um, there's a lot of ways things can go wrong with batteries. Batteries in particular are one of the least reliable forms of, um, one of the least reliable components in electrical engineering. And it's because there's, they're, they're, they're more a chemical system than an electrical system. Um, so there's all sorts of ways things can go wrong. Um, there's not, there's the most, uh, I wouldn't say the most common, but a, a, a way things can go wrong is you get an internal cell short, which is the cath, remember what I said earlier, there's a cathode nanode in the battery and there's an electrolyte that's supposed to go through that. Well, if the cathode nanode touch somewhere in the battery, you have a short circuit. Um, and then current's gonna flow through that short circuit and then eventually that gets hot and then that causes problems. Um, so the way you get around that is you quality control your batteries, which was one of the things that we did. We, we had stringent quality control measures for our battery vendors, um, who shall remain nameless, um, to uh, how they produced their batteries um, had to be to a degree where we were confident there wouldn't be an internal uh, cell shorting to them. Um, so that was usually like a process thing. So uh, were there inspection steps to make sure there weren't a problem? Did they test for it? Did they x-ray the cells? Things like that. Um, past that, there's a lot of ways you can mistreat a battery and also it'll blow up. And actually I would say that's far more common than an internal short is something goes wrong where it like overcharges the battery, undercharges the battery. Um, there's, you know, so 
as an example, um, there's thermal runaway. So you get the battery too hot and it goes in a runaway and blows up. Um, there's uh, overcharging it. You put too much current in, you put too much energy into the battery. Uh, it goes beyond its voltage rating and then weird chemical things start to happen. It breaks down and blows up is the moral of the story. Um, and then there's over discharging, which is also a problem. Um, you discharge the battery, you take all the energy out of it, which is fine, but then you start taking too much energy out of it. Batteries have kind of an operating range, and if you take too much energy out of it, it will keep providing that energy. But what's happening is you're breaking down the chemical bonds inside the battery to do that. So it's actually damaged. So then when you go to charge it again, if you charge it to the same level you charged it last time, you've actually now overcharged it. Hmm. So you can get into a very dangerous situation there where you like discharge a battery too much, and then you catch it and you go, oh, let me recharge it. And you charge it up again and then the thing blows up. Um, so we had all sorts of systems in place to prevent any of that from happening. Um, not to say that, it, you know, there were, there were incidents along the way, um, mostly things that happen in test um, where you try to suss out these issues before they actually happen on a spacecraft. And I think for us, we never had an incident on a spacecraft, which was great. Um, but we did a lot of work to make sure that didn't happen. Um, and that we did have things happen in tests and we did have things happen in some integration steps and things like that. Um, and, uh, you learn from those experiences and you learn how to make them better. And you, you learn, Oh, there's maybe this is a way to blow up a battery that we didn't think of. Or, um, one that was pretty common was like, you give a battery to the integration setup and then they would over discharge it. And then you'd be like, Oh, um, we need to have a system in place to where it can flag that as a, problem so you never try to charge that battery again hmm. things like that so um there's uh that's sort of a uh, a sneak preview i'd say in how in-depth you can go for making an electronic system like a battery system safe on a spacecraft okay um since you kind of talked you started to go into to talking well since you mentioned testing and then finding yeah. uh, lessons like lessons learned from that are you can you go into any um, any lessons learned stories or is that getting too deep into I can go um, into I'll go into one actually okay um, so this is one of the last systems I worked on uh, in the uh, at my career at SpaceX um, I think I can go into more detail on it because um, it's sort of a it was done between the government and the and SpaceX um, so there's uh, there's some more public information out there about it than there was uh, before, but we basically, um, I would say, let me back up a second actually before I go into that. Um, at, a high, at a very high level, testing is very important. And I think um, for SpaceX, we emphasize test quite a lot. And I think that was actually one of the smarter things we did. We were, um, we even went to the degree of having static fires where other companies didn't. And that didn't, that didn't bite us once. We did have a static fire incident that blew up a, a booster on pad and took out the payload. Um, I think it was the Enos um, payload, if I remember right. Um, but that, um, that aside, we actually, you know, we were known for doing a lot of testing. Um, and I think also, too, some of that was levied on us as well because we were a relatively unknown entity and then NASA didn't quite know what to do with us. So they said, okay, well, here's a bunch of tests. Go through that before you even think about knocking to the space station. Um, and we did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's, I would say that um, the testing, you tended to learn things from. Um, so I had one project that I was involved in in particular. Um, this was the autonomous flight termination system. Um, and one of the things that happened on that system was there was some energy storage in the system um, and it was, uh, it was a capacitor energy storage. Um, and we learned that um, some of the, even though sort of like you can have a system where everything kind of meets spec and looks good and then you put it on the shaker table and it doesn't work, um, yep. that's <laughs> the thing that could happen. And actually what was scarier than that um, for this is a neurally prototype of the system that I'm talking about. This isn't the system flu. No, but um, when we were working on it, we had problems where like things weren't repeatable. Like one in every ten would fail. 
and it was sort of like, Whoa, what's going on? Um, and it turns out it was the vendor was actually making minor changes to this part, and uh, we didn't, you know, they weren't really documenting those changes very well. It was just sort of like, um, I think it was literally they were like putting a shim in or putting a different type of shim into every part, um, and it was sort of like, well, what's what's happening? Like you would see like these are the exact same parts from the same lot. They would all fail, or no, no, sorry. One out of ten would fail, um, and it would, it would. What's going on? And then you find out from the manufacturer what they're doing is every single part in that lot they would have to manually by hand shim it to the right tolerance stackups where they could solder the top of it. Um, I actually go into a little bit more detail on that. The, the part I'm talking about is a wet, called a wet tantalum capacitor. Um, the way that works is you have a uh, you have a slug uh, you have a metal like can. Then you have a slug of tantalum, and then you have this like sulfuric acid bath on the inside of it. Um, and what happens is you put that slug in the sulfuric acid bath that uh, creates a contact barrier. Uh, it, it creates an oxide layer essentially across this this tantalum slug. Um, it's very very thin. And if you remember in school and capacitors the way they work, um, the thinner that dielectric is, the better. So it actually ends up being a very, very strong, uh, powerful, energy dense storage medium. Problem is that that tantalum slug is now is encased in uh, sulfuric acid, which is a liquid. So if there's any sort of vibration to it, it can go and start to hit the wall of the can or something like that, and then you have problems. Um, so we would have we were having problems like that where it would just like they would short out, um, mm -hmm. and of course tantalum being what it is, uh, if when you have a short it reforms the electrode, so it kind of like it's kind of there and it goes away. So it's like a magic bullet in a way. It's kind of you know you never know what happened, um, and uh, but we started to dive into it and what we found out was that there was you know you put that that tantalum slug into the can. Um, different shims were used to get the tantalum slug to the right height, and then you would put a, another, like, backing onto the capacitor, and then you would solder, you would, uh, sorry, not solder, weld that shut. Um, and that weld had to be to a right tolerance in the, um, between the can lid and the backing lid. And to get that tolerance, you had to shim it just right. So every single thing, every single capacitor was built differently. Um, and it turns out, if you x-rayed them, and you saw how they were built. Ones that were built in one way worked perfectly. Ones that were built in another way did not work and would even fail at like really small levels, you know, like levels that were way below what we were trying to hit. Um, so it was one of the, these are, this is an example of a lesson that we learned going through our testing program. Um, the lesson we ultimately learned was don't use that type of capacitor, use something <laughs> robust right. um, and that was actually turns out that's what um, we talked to some people in the capacitor industry and that's what they sold us as well was like oh we stopped making these because they had all sorts of problems with vibration okay <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> um, that was that was a lesson that was a big lesson learned though um, for us in that particular way and if you imagine at a company like SpaceX you're learning these lessons like every day um, right. there's always something new to learn um, and uh, it's, I would say more so than other industries that I've worked at or seen, um, space flight is one of those ways where you have to be very paranoid about every little thing that can go wrong. Um, and the more things you're paranoid about, the better your design can be at the end of the day. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone in the space industry knows that lesson very well. It, it's a little hard to talk to people about that in other industries too because they, you know, it, it depends on what the industry is and how, you know, how in depth they go. And there's some of the things that other industries have that spaceflight doesn't, like volume, for instance. How do you make a million of something? That's a very challenging problem. Mm -hmm. And space doesn't really have that problem because a million of something doesn't exist. You know, you're making like one of something or ten of something or if you're SpaceX, a hundred of something. You know, and that's that's it. <laughs> okay. Are um, aside from vibrations, are you allowed to talk about any of the other ways that you usually go about testing and uh, qualifying yeah. batteries? So um, a lot of this is actually documented in government standards. So oh, okay. um, it's actually pretty easy to, to tell what to do. I, I think it was, uh, 
Uh, I don't remember the number, number off the top of my head, but they're, oh, that's okay. they're, they're out there. Numbers, um, numbers. Yes. Um, so essentially, testing a spacecraft actually looks, or testing, so there, well, let's back up. So there's different levels of test. Um, ideally, when you test something, you test it at the highest possible level, which means you test in the whole rocket, for instance. So, and for the spacecraft, that's actually something you can very easily do, or, well, easily more easily than a rocket you can take a whole spacecraft and say put that in an emi chamber you have to build a very big emi chamber to do that but you can do that um and they exist and there's also vacuum chambers that exist for something that big as well so you can end up doing like your all of your tvac testing on your entire spacecraft you have to call nasa up and say you know here's uh, we need to use your one facility that can do this in the world for you know a few weeks. Um, <laughs> um, but with a, something like a rocket, though, you you don't get a chance to do that. And there's you know it comes in two stages anyways, which are really themselves two different vehicles. Um, at least for SpaceX, um, you treat them as two completely different vehicles. And I think most of the industry does this as well, um, even more so for other vehicles because they use common second stages with other vehicles or something like that. Anyways, um, what the problem is then, you have like a first stage rocket, how do you EMI test something like that? You can't just right. throw that in a chamber. So what you have to do is you have to break that down into smaller levels. And you say, oh, I'm not gonna test the rocket, I'm gonna test the avionics portion of the rocket. Well, what is that? Well, maybe there's a part of the rocket that has the most avionic systems in it, and then there's a few disparate parts throughout. Um, and that's the case with the Falcon 9. I think this is pretty common knowledge. There's a, um, a part of the uh, Falcon 9 called the Octoweb, um, which is where all the engines are, essentially. Um, that's where most of the brains of the vehicle are. That's where most of the avionics live. There's a few kind of scattered throughout, but if for the most part, a rocket's very much empty space. It's it's fuel and oxidizer, and you try to maximize as much fuel and oxidizer as you can, which means you minimize as much other things as you can. Um, so for the rocket, um, you would test these smaller portions. Well, the problem is then, how do you get all these things in one place at the same time to test them? Because they're all changing, and they're all being tested and um, put together at different, different times. Um, so, in a lot of cases, it's easier to do box level testing. You, you segment your avionics system out into, okay, we're going to have this box, this box, and this box, and they have controlled interfaces between them, uh, cables, essentially. Um, and you're going to eat, when you EMI test it, you test it at a box level. Um, and this is how the industry mostly does things. Um, so, you, uh, you have these chambers that can do boxes, so they're small. They're a lot smaller. They're a lot cheaper, and they they're you can and for a lot of cases they're standard, so you can buy them off the shelf. Um, and you have standard equipment to do this with. Um, box testing in particular, there's kind of a flow to it. It looks the same between every box. It's because they're doing the same tests for every box that you would do at a vehicle level. Um, so what you would do essentially, you do a vibration test. Um, so, actually, let, let, me, let me do a further breakdown of that. There's, there's two types of testing on top of that. There's qualification testing and there's acceptance testing. Qualification testing is you're going to test this before you fly to, to verify your design works. And then acceptance testing is, okay, you verify the design works. How do you know that this was built correctly? You know, those are, that's kind of the point of the two tests. One is to do, you know, does this meet workmanship standard and one is to, you, you beat it up and you say, does it still work at the end of the day? Um, so qualification testing tends to be more severe. You tend to do the more fun tests for that one. Um, so qualification tests, you're going to have vibe, you're going to have thermal, you're going to have TVAC. In a lot of cases, you can do TVAC instead of thermal, but TVAC chambers are usually more expensive and harder to get. So you tend to do as much thermal as you can in the thermal chamber, and then you just a little bit of tea back at the end, and that's, that covers your bases there. Um, and then you have uh, uh, EMI, which is usually the last thing that gets done to the box because you want the box to be a little damaged before it does the EMI testing. Um, okay. Like, yeah, seen, seen some field experiences. Um, and then you also you have other tests as well, which you do kind of on a case by case basis. There's like humidity testing, high temperature operating life. Um, you have fungal testing. Um, there's uh, 
it doesn't grow fungus essentially. It, it, there's some really oddball military tests. Interesting. Out there. What yeah. what would make it grow fungus? Um, so I think a lot of that's actually from uh, because it was done to a military standard. Uh, the military has to worry about all sorts of different environments where these things happen. Um, so the fungal test would be one. Um, I remember it was it was a very high humidity test. Um, and it was not one we ever executed, but it was one I, I knew of from reading the military standards that existed. Um, and that was you know, like you do a very high humidity test and you get a certain temp a certain temperature and you see if mold grows over time or something like that. I think that makes a lot more sense for something like you know personal protective equipment. Maybe less sense for a rocket. But um, in any case, uh, humidity testing was, was certainly a big one though. And that was mm -hmm. um, you essentially have a very high temperature as much humidity as you can, and then you lower the temperature so you get condensation. You try okay. to you try to force condensation to happen, and you see if anything shorts out because of that. Um, so there's that's kind of the, but the standard flow I would say is generally thermal by PVAC EMI. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some things, some steps in there, but those are the those are, those are the main tests that I would be worried about. Oh, shock! That was the other big one. Shock. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, those are the main ones I would be worried about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then uh, acceptance testing, you do an abbreviated version of usually vitamin thermal. Um, and some, some instances you would do other things on top of that, but those are the main ones. Um, and for each of those tests, you would be doing a functional test in between them, or sometimes during them, uh, to show that the box is working to standard. Um, and so if you see any problems with a box, uh, it'll exercise the whole thing and it'll say like, oh, it looks like this one circuit doesn't work. You know, maybe this mm -hmm. pyro circuit doesn't work or this sensor doesn't work or something like that. Okay. And so that's that's the general test flow. Mm -hmm. um, what what you would see happen uh, between these different tests though is like, you know, there would be different levels for each box and every box would have to meet certain things. And then at the end of it, you know, everything would be put together, you would analyze it and show, oh, well, qualifica qualification wise, this box has seen exactly what we'd expect. And then when you fly the vehicle, you would have, typically you, you'd have a few test flights where the first of the generation, and even even afterwards, it still makes sense to, to do this. You'd um, put a lot of accelerometers and a lot of sensors and a lot of ways to tell um, if your predicted environments were correct. And if they're not correct, then you go back and test everything to those new levels plus margin. That's, that's kind of like a, that, that's how testing worked in uh, SpaceX mm -hmm. in general. Um, and that's, that's generally the way it works for most of the industry as well. Um, I would say that some of the fun lessons learned there, vibe is a very difficult one in space. Um, that's what I, I typically talk a lot about. It's actually one of, the few, one of the ones where you can do very little about as an electrical designer. Um, There's some components that are very susceptible to vibe, so you try not to use those. But for the most part, vibe is usually like you have a very heavy component that sees some vibe that gets shaken and the leads fall apart and it falls off the board or something like that. So then you have to like either stake it or you pot it or um, potting is like a, it's like a compound you pour on the, uh, the printed circuit board and it's like a glue that holds everything together. Um, and then there's, there's other methods as well, but those are some of the um, potting and staking are usually the common way to deal with those kind of problems. Um, and then there's other problems you run into too, like if your circuit board resonates with the vibrational frequency that you're testing to, um, the whole thing's going to fall apart. It doesn't matter how much glue you apply to it. Um, so then you have to design it such that you have screw holes in the right place to keep those resonances from happening. And it, mm. it, it's really complicated really quickly. It's actually a very big mechanical design problem um, that happens for electronic pieces. Um, and then thermal, that's more in the realm of electronics engineer. Like you generally, um, there's, there's thermal cycling which can cause problems. And that's usually like solder type problems. Um, like solder fails at certain components and then that causes cracking and then you don't have a component there anymore. Um, but there's also other problems too, like if your box gets too hot and it generates too much heat and then it goes into a runaway and a part breaks because of that. Um, that's a bad design, you need to go fix that. Um, and then there's also problems at cold temperature I've seen too, where like if something gets too cold, then it doesn't work anymore because it's out of the operating range that the components expect. Um, or, it, you know, maybe maybe it's in range and the manufacturer has a problem they don't know about. That's also happened before too. Hmm. Um, so there's there's all sorts of lessons learned from from things like that. I would say the 
some programs are worse about it than others. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, one of the big programs that I worked on was the, the flight termination system, the one I mentioned earlier. Um, they had more tests because they were much more concerned about the system. Um, it was based sort of like the way that system worked, it was, it was supposed to be the last thing that breaks on the rocket, essentially. Okay. Um, and because of that, um, you had to, it, it got, you know, it got levels way beyond everything else. Like the margins on it were beyond everything, every other component on the rocket, because that's the one that had to work. And then on top of that, the Air Force is looking over your shoulder the whole time to make sure that you're doing everything that you said you were going to do. Um, so there's a, that, that one was a particularly stressful test program. There's um, getting two tests was very difficult. And I think actually for that program, we did a lot of pre-testing beforehand. We were, we were like create a design, and then before we do the official test, we would actually go through our own in-house testing and then go, oh, mm. you know, break it in as many ways as you possibly can. And we would find all sorts of different ways to break things. It was, it was pretty great. It was a pretty crazy program, but I, it was fun. <laughs> nice. Um, kind of going uh, more off of testing. So, so you've worked both on kind of the rocket side and then at Astronus on uh, more of the spacecraft side. Yeah. So what are some of the ways that, uh, I guess, spacecraft, developing avionics for spacecraft is, is different, like in terms of EMI, radiation, contamination control? Oh, yeah, that, that's actually really good. things I can think so, of. So, yeah, um, so I would say, like, of, there's kind of three types of systems I work on. There's the rocket, there's the spacecraft, and there's the satellite systems. And they have very three, the reason they're, they're different is because they have very different missions to them. Rocket's only going to work for a few hours at most. Um, a spacecraft, maybe a few days to a few months. Maybe it'll stay on orbit a year, and, but it's parked at the space station not doing anything during that year. Um, and then a satellite, that's expected to work for 10 years straight or however long its mission life is, um, usually in the order of years. Um, and then you have like a ton of engineering margin beyond that. Um, so the things that were very different between those, I ended up being um, one of the people that learned a lot about radiation effects as a design engineer there. Um, I actually found it very interesting, so I ended up learning a lot about it myself. Um, and kind of tried to, to speak the same, I tried to teach the other design engineers how to do you know, radiation effects engineering and so forth. Um, it was interesting because on the rocket, radiation effects aren't that big a deal. Your mission duration is very short. And because of that, you know, the probability of anything happening, even a single end effect, is not quite that high. Um, now, that said, you, you do want to mitigate those single end effects, especially because those can cause problems like rockets going off course. Um, so you, uh, try to do things to prevent those. I'll go into detail about what that looks like in a second, but um, it's less important than a spacecraft. A spacecraft, you have hours for things to happen, and it's floating around in space without the Earth's protection, um, either in low Earth orbit or in some cases in higher uh, orbits, um, where there's not the protection of the, the different proton belts and so forth, um, and, the, and the atmosphere of the Earth. Um, so because of that, you're going to get a lot more single event effects. Um, and those become a lot more important to deal with. Um, but there's generally not enough radiation there for um, dose to be a problem, for instance. There's actually, um, the way I would break it down is there's three radiation effects. There's dose, there's uh, not um, NEIL, which is basically dose in another form. It's dose from high energy particles. Um, and then there's uh, or displacement damage would be the other way to call it, I would guess. Um, it is. Same deal. Um, and then there's the single event effects. Um, dose isn't really a, that much of a problem when you're in low Earth orbit, even for longer duration missions. Um, it, it, it can become a problem if you're up there for a while, um, but generally not. Um, and then when you're on a satellite hanging out in space for years, um, then you have a problem with dose. And that's when you have to start worrying about those effects. Um, I would say in my career, what I've seen is sort of, it was funny when I started out, it was like, oh, great, like, what, what's the radiation effect? And then after that, it was like, oh, now, now I have to know, like, exactly how much everything is affecting the spacecraft over its lifetime. Um, so here's, like, the 
20 to 30 different types of effects that can happen um, mm -hmm. and the ways it can cause all sorts of problems and how, what's your mitigation plan for every single one of them. Um, and I say with a satellite, that's critically important. Um, now, there's, that said, there's other things on satellites that are easier. Vibration, for one, you're sitting at the top of the rocket and at the bottom of it, so vibration tends to be a lot better at the at the top. Same for the spacecraft, too. Um, all the spacecraft are a little heavier, so they can have some problems, and they also have things like big thrusters on them, um, which can cause some problems, if, especially if you have super dracos. <laughs> and uh, there's, um, I would say also, too, uh, some spacecraft, there's different effects that can happen. I know for us, on the original Dragon, and Dragon, the, the second iteration of Dragon, um, the Cargo Dragon, um, there was a lot of shock events that happened on that vehicle. So shock was actually a big problem. And it was actually a bigger problem than the, um, than the rocket in a lot of cases. Um, the reason, I think for us, I'll go into, I'll, I'll go into some detail about this because this is a design decision that people deserve, deserve to know not to do it again. Um, <laughs> there was, okay. uh, we had mounted a parachute mortar directly onto the frame for Cargo Dragon, um, and which was fine and good, except for the fact that every single avionics box on that vehicle saw the same shock events because of it. And we were now talking about shock events that you couldn't do on a shaker table with shaker shock. You had to go to a drop shock or a mm. hammer shock or something like that to do it. And at that, you were dialing it up to like 10 to, or 11 even to do those, those levels. Um, I remember, uh, this is, this is, this is going to date me a little bit. I remember when we had a, a drop shock set up inside of SpaceX. Um, we were literally, it, this was a, mind you, this, the building we were working out of used to be a 747 hangar. So it's a huge building. Um, I can't remember exactly how tall the ceilings were, but it's, it's you know, easily two or three stories worth of a building. Um, and you would have a drop weight, you would drag up all the way to the top of the building, it would go down the little tube, and it would hit the frame that your avionics box is sitting on. It had to survive that. And that broke a lot of things. It was hitting it so hard that cards were popping out the back of the, the boxes and stuff. And we had to fix all of that before things. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And you also have other things that happen too, like the card would pop out back. And then because of the spring force of the, the box, it would pop it back into the slot and you would have bent pins. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Um, so, the, I mean, those are some of the fun things you have to deal with in the space industry is uh, right. uh, you fix broken things. <laughs> um, and uh, there, I would say the spacecraft had, had a different set of problems to it, and then the satellite had a further different set of problems on top of that. Uh, longevity, life, reliability, and radiation effects being the, the key of those. Um, but you... I would say if you go through the trajectory that I went through, where you go rockets, spacecraft, then satellites, you, you tend to learn a lot along the way on that. Um, and that it actually tends to be towards what you need to learn, too. So like rockets, the reliability, you know, it, it's kind of work, but it only has to work for a few hours. That's, that's a much different problem than it has to work for a few years. Mm -hmm. I guess one, one last question that I, I did want to ask is, Maybe and maybe we already answered this question kind of at the beginning, but yeah. kind of circling back to because um, you know I'm just thinking a lot of the listeners are in case a lot of my listeners are you know college students like myself yeah um, so we we kind of touched on this a little bit at the beginning but I, I kind of want to circle back to it um, so working at more of like a SpaceX when it was a little bit more developed versus startups um, mm -hmm. are there benefits to working at one over the other and do you have any advice for students in, in choosing a route to go when it comes to um, figuring out which route they want to take yeah no the, I would say there definitely is I mean there's I would say the way the industry is right now um, there's the startup land, there's sort of the medium size players, which would be like SpaceX, and then there's the more established players, which would be like the Boeing or the Lockheed of the world, um, the, the prime defense contractors, if you will. Um, and I think um, sort of between all of those, there's, um, there's a lot of difference between those companies. Um, at a startup, okay, so let's, let's take a bigger company to, to start with. Um, I can't speak for the super big prime contractors. I can say what other people have told me, but I can't 
speak for this myself, so I won't. Um, the medium so more size companies, though, where you're actually working with NASA and government customers and cust established customers, I would say, um, you're typically, you're very driven in terms of what you do to be very process oriented. Um, you, there's a lot of requirements. You have to learn, that's one thing I've learned over my career too, is how to deal with requirements. Um, and that's something that you do not teach you in school. Um, then that's, oh no, no, yeah, they don't. No, not at all. And it really should be like a class or something, because it, it, it can go pretty in depth. Um, essentially what it is, how do you architect the system from the start mm -hmm. without missing anything? Um, and, you know, it, it, anyways, it, um, it gets, it can get very overwhelming. Um, and I think what surprised me a lot with working at SpaceX when we went to the more established customers and the more established um, what they what their expectations were, um, they tended to have just everything spelled out for what you had to do. And to a degree where it was like, here's your spacecraft requirements, and then you had to flow those down to here's your box level requirements, here's like this system's requirements, here's this other system's requirements. And then it was like managing how those different requirements interact with each other. That became a big problem. Um, because what you'll find sometimes is like different departments have different ways to manage different things. And that's actually, that kind of touches on a big difference too, is when you're in a startup, you don't have different departments. You have, you, you, you in, in a lot of cases, one person is the department. Mm -hmm. you, are, you are the department of, of whatever you, it is you work on, and then you probably also are responsible for something else and not for that. Um, when you're at a more established company, it's more, you can start to see more of a division of labor. Um, and then there's all sorts of problems that come out of, you know, there's good things that happen with division of labor, because then you can get really good at doing one particular thing over and over again. Um, but the problem that comes out of that is that making sure that when you do that one particular thing, it's what it's a, a good thing, quote unquote. It's a necessary thing for the company, or it benefits the company in some way. Um, and that's that's different than any uh, startup where it's like the benefit for the company is your product works and you make money. <laughs> at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter like how far you get with that. Well, it doesn't. It matters how far you get with that, but it. it end of the day, you make a lot of compromises for your products to get it out the door, quote unquote, like working, ship, what, what have you. Um, and then, but with a more established player, you're not necessarily, getting shipped is not the whole battle. So that's, that's especially when SpaceX grew, that's what I noticed. Um, Astronus was also very much that way too. It was like, you gotta get it shipped. Um, and then the company I'm at right now, um, we're starting to become a bigger player in the automotive space and we're starting to also go through that same learning process of like, oh, customers have expectations and we have to go through and learn how to ship things. Uh, or not, not just ship things, but like make them reliable and have process around them and make sure that we can, make sure we can put our reputation behind this pr uh, product. When you're a startup, you don't have a reputation to put behind your product, which is different than a more established player. So. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Last question, which is a question I I like to ask ev everyone I interview, um, yeah. which is: Do you do you have any favorite stories from any of your uh, any of your work experience that you would like to share? Sure. Let me think. Um, can be tales of magic smoke. Can be <laughs> success. Um. um hmm. I. I'm gonna think about this for a minute, actually. Um, okay. So, I've had a couple at SpaceX. They were just, I mean, I had there's some. I'm sure, more than one. I'm yeah, yeah. I, I love hearing stories. <laughs> yeah, no, I can go through war stories all day. Actually, <laughs> they're really, I, I've got a ton of them. And they're all really fun. At least to me, they're really fun. I think some mm -hmm. of the people don't, are like, "What are you talking about?" Um, <laughs> I'm at parties. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but I would say. One of the ones that I had that was very interesting to me was um, this autonomous flight termination system. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through it a little bit. I think it's more of a human story to me than it is an actual technical story. So what happened with that system essentially is I came onto it late. Um, it had already been in development for kind of a few years before I, I came onto it. Um, and what happened was, uh, there was, 
trying to give everyone the benefit of the doubt here. It's it. There were some organizational issues behind how the program came out. Um, what happened in a way was um, there was a split between like, oh, we're going to make this new system and we're going to make this classic system. Um, so let me, let me back up a second. So what is what is flight term? What is flight safety? What is flight termination? And so forth. Um, so you have context. Um, flight safety basically means we're worried about the case circumstance. And it has a very particular meaning for the space community. What that means is like, um, we have a rocket, it's going up to space, goes off course, what happens? So in our particular case, or, okay, in, if you have a flight safety system, what that means is you have a system that prevents it from going off course and causing loss of human life or catastrophic property damage to something. Um, in particular, this is very important when you, um, you know, are launching rockets near a very populated area. With an example being launching out of Cape Canaveral in Florida, where you're close to Miami or, you know, other areas. Or, you know, you don't want to crash a rocket in Africa, for instance. Um, that could cause international issues, you know, and all sorts of things like that. Um, but the, the, the basic point is you don't want your rocket to, cla to crash back to Earth. And kill someone, you know. So what do you do about that? Um, since the early days of the space program, what they've done is they've added a little bit of explosives to the rocket, um, put a, a system on there to where a person from the ground can initiate termination, I, I, aka blow up the rocket. Um, and that person usually sits on console um, and they have, uh, I think it's, he said know the name of the, the person, like Mifco or something like that. Um, but they um, they sit at the, the mission control and they're watching the rocket as it you know as it flies. And if it goes off course, they're gonna um, hit the the big red button, so to speak, that'll blow the rocket up. Uh, and they'll send a radio signal to the rocket that initiates the system that causes the explosives to go off. But that's the basic gist of it. Um, what we learned at SpaceX is that. Um, there are certain types, okay, so we learned a couple of things. Um, one thing we learned is that this FTS system, um, that's what it's called, FTS, um, is very old and uh, it's very, I mean, it's, it, you can look at the early days of space flight and it's a very similar system to what they, they used, you know, even five years ago. Um, it was, you know, you're, you have, basically you have a giant radar dish that watches the rocket. Um, and that radar dish tells you, you know, where it is and how far of course it is or whatnot. Um, and then the guy looking at it, making the decision, do I do anything about this? And then you have the big button that's pressed and then that causes the series of events that causes the rocket to go away. Um, and what we learned is that this, it's, the system is all an Air Force system. And it's very, A, it's difficult, it's difficult to, um, sorry, uh, do you mind if I, uh, I need to, to Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, about that. Uh, anyways, um, so in any case, we learned a couple of things. One thing being that these systems are very old, um, that the Air Force put into place, and they're, they're kind of in disrepair sometimes, too. Um, there were instances, you can look them up in the, uh, on the Google, probably, um, where some of these radar sites would, you know, occasionally catch fire or a radar get damaged or something like that because the systems are just so outdated. It took them a while to repair these systems. Um, so you would actually have large periods of your business, SpaceX being a launch company, where um, you can't launch because something of completely out of your control, you know, well, that's, that's not great. Um, and then some, there are some other things too, like these systems were very limited in their capabilities. Um, so there, uh, one particular instance would be, if, let's say you have a system like, okay, well, let me back up. Um, you have a system like Falcon 9 where you want to land the rocket back on land. So, Beforehand, when you had an FTS system, you launched a rocket and it went over the atmosphere. Um, that was it. 
you know, and your, your mission's done, you, you disarm the system, the rock breaks up, and everyone's happy. Um, problem is if it's coming back towards the land, um, you have to protect the public as it's coming back as well. So now you've doubled your mission time, and you've made it a lot harder. Um, the radar systems had trouble tracking the rocket's landing. Um, I, I can't quote exactly what or how much, just believe me that they, they had some problems. Um, and uh, if you were doing something like a Falcon Heavy, where you had three rockets coming back, uh, that was just completely like a non-starter. Like, it just wouldn't happen. So we had to come up with an autonomous system to, to do this. What that meant was taking the radar and taking the man with the button out of the loop and putting a system on the vehicle that can monitor if the vehicle is going off course. Um, if it is, initiate a termination event. Um, and this had to be done without any human intervention. Um, so that's actually a very hard problem in and of itself. Um, oh, yeah. And it took us, you know, it, it took them a few years to kind of come up with a system to do it. Um, they, you know, they, they cut their teeth on it. And they, they, you know, they had something. Um, but we started to see, we started, the way these programs work is you, you sort of get a funky smell come from these programs every now and again. It's like, oh, what's going on? It's like, oh, you know, well, um, it, it, for, for a battery program, maybe you have your fire and battery program and then all of the management in the company goes, wait, why did your battery catch fire? And then everyone goes, oh, um, maybe this program's got some problems. And then, then executives start to ask questions and things happen, things like that. So anyways, in this FTS system, we started to see some instances of smoke coming from this program. Um, and some of this was looking like, oh, um, the system inadvertently terminated the rocket for no particular reason. Mm, that's not good. What happened there? Oh, and also the system's got a lot of problems. Like what was happening was we were starting to put the system on the rocket operationally for the time, um, not hooked up to explosives, just, you know, just to, but wanted to test it out, just to kick the tires and see how it was working. And we were starting to see some problems and that was bringing on a lot of oversight and some people were looking at it. Um, then uh, they started bringing on engineers to double check the work that was happening. And we started looking into it and we started to realize, oh, um, this system is not ready yet. Um, there's a lot of time before we need to like actually do this. When does the system need to work by, by the way? Oh, um, ooh, it's, uh, it's gonna work within you know, this period of time or there's gonna be problems. Um, so we ended up doing a lot, we ended up doing a lot to like make the system work within the period of time we need to make it work. The, hmm. The reason we had to do that was because we, you know, made promises we we're going to fly Falcon Heavy by a certain point and make land landings, and um, we needed this system to do all that. Um, when we looked at it, we started to see some of the reasons we were having so many problems with this program. Um, one of the big ones being there was just requirements creep all over the place. Um, mm. You would see things like we would have to. We, there's um, because the system was terminating the rocket, the people on the crew program were super worried about this. Like, you, you couldn't, you know, oh my God, like, how do you, how do, you deal with that with a crew on the vehicle? Um, mm -hmm. So there was all sorts of things that they did to make their system safe. Um, then there was the people that, you know, from the Air Force that were the range safety people. They, you know, what they were concerned about. And then there was the... Um, there was the people at SpaceX who were concerned, like, oh, we're going to blow up the rocket by accident. That's a problem. We don't want that to happen. Um, and, you know, just kind of everyone in between. And everyone was kind of pushing the system in, into a system that couldn't work, essentially. Um, so we had to take some steps. Um, I think one of the big ones that I was actually kind of happy with in retrospect was saying that we're not going to make the system work for crew off the bat. Um, and that that eased things up a lot. Um, it it, it didn't, didn't make the system any less reliable. And actually, we could make it a lot more reliable doing that because we didn't have to have some of the um, uh, crew safety features in place, for instance. Um, and uh, those safety features require extra component space, and that extra component space you don't have because your box is only so big, and all sorts of things just add up to this. Um, but being able to kind of go through your program as you're, you're building this device and look at your requirements uh, in the way back and say, oh, 
that actually is going to cause us a problem. We need to do something about that um, or not do something about it now and come up with a, a solution later. Um, that probably ended up saving SpaceX a lot of lost money, um, being able to do that. Um, and then that's, we still had a very hard problem on our hands. We still had, a, you know, I think um, when I first started the program, I was like, oh, you know, this will take a few months and then you'll we'll be done with it. And it was like a year and a half later. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> now I'm done. Um, that was when we first had our operational launch was a year and a half after I started on that program. Um, but uh, once that was done, um, it was a, it was a fantastic program. Everything looked great. They, no one saw the, you know, all the, the warts and problems we had along the way. It was just sort of like, it just worked. And actually ever since that came out, um, we did a second version for crew, uh, which had all the safety features that the crew people wanted plus all the lessons learned from the first time around. Um, and we were able to do that on a much uh, longer term schedule because crew wasn't ready yet. That was kind of the big problem. It was like crew wasn't ready, but they, were, they had 50% of the requirements, you know, something like that, uh, on what this thing could do. Whereas the, um, the range safety people, they, you know, they, had the most, they had the most stringent requirements that we had to meet, and we could meet them if we wanted to meet everyone else's at the same time. Um, once we kind of figured out, oh, which the range safety requirements we need to meet and being able to do these high cadence of launch, then we could execute something, then we could close it. And we learned a ton doing mm -hmm. that. And then when we came around to do it the second time, everything was smooth. Um, nice. But it took us a lot of work to get to that point. I think there was a lot of like, oh no, what are we doing moments along the way. Um, there was a couple of times where we had uh, big problems with the system or like, oh, there's the capacitor issue I mentioned before and that um, we ended up replacing that with a more robust capacitor solution. Um, and then there was also uh, some problems with the computing software I mentioned before, like, oh, when your management gets involved when it's like, oh, you, what happened? Um, and uh, that, um, that ended up being a big deal, actually. That was not one I was super involved in. I was more of the hardware guy than the software guy, but I saw there was just a tremendous amount of effort done in the software to make that system safe. And it was, it, it was good work that was being done there to make sure, that, and I think that's made the whole industry better as a result. Um, and then there was, um, when we got to the end of it, we put this new capacitor solution in. Of course, that doesn't work off the bat. Um, so then you have to fix all the problems that come with that as well. Um, like falling off in the middle of vibration testing, um, just straight up falling off the board. How do you deal with that? Oh no. <laughs> How do you deal with that in like three months left to go? Um, was, it was, uh, and, and I would say programs like that, they're certainly the most stressful programs, but they're also the ones where you really get a lot of learning opportunities from. Um, I would say just as sort of like advice to people coming into the field for the first time, you know, like you can get into situations like this, like be prepared to deal with these situations and be prepared to kind of like um, learn from mistakes. Like mistakes happen all the time. I make mistakes every day, you know, and that's okay. Like it has, you, you find ways to make mistakes where you can um, sort of, firewall the problem just to your just to certain areas so that it doesn't become a huge problem where like everyone's involved um and then you start to figure out ways to kind of iterate learn figure out what's going wrong um yeah yeah no, that's that's a that's a good note because that's definitely i feel that that's very hard to transition to yeah out of coming out of school and, and going into the industry is, yeah, is getting think, into that mindset. One thing that helps with that a little bit is rotating through different parts of the process too. Like if you become a designer and you just stay a designer, like the problem is you never really learn what people on test have to deal with or what people on manufacturing have to deal with or anything like that. It's good to get your hands dirty and like go out into the you know manufacturing field for a while and learn. I, I think that was one of the, the unique things about SpaceX is it's such a vertically integrated company. Like there's everything there. Um, like every, uh, like I think we did everything short of making the PCBs ourselves. We actually made some of our own like integrated circuits even. Um, and so you got to learn everything mm -hmm. if you wanted to, and you had to want to. 
you had to go out there every day and, and learn something new about why your thing doesn't work. But the more you learn, you learn the better you get at it. Mm. No, that's very good advice. Well, on that note, I think that's a that's a great way to kind of segue out of the, yeah, the conversation. Thank you. But yeah, no, thank you for doing this with me. This is yeah, really no, fun, no. and I definitely learned a lot about a topic yeah. I knew very little about. <laughs> so yeah, no worries. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, so just for context, I was at SpaceX between 2010 and about 2000 in the 2017. Um, so beginning of 2010 into 2017, um, they it was a roller coaster ride. Um, and I don't think any other start, I, I don't know if any other startup is going to go through quite that ride as well. Like everyone's ride is going to be very different. But if you get the chance to get involved in the startup early on like that, um, it's a risk, but it can be worth the risk. So. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's all for today's episode of The Art of Space Engineering. Thank you once again to Kate for coming on this podcast and sharing a little bit about what it's like to work at SpaceX and other stories as well. And thank you all so much for tuning into this podcast and supporting it. I'm so grateful to have this platform to share all of this really awesome information with you all. And I'm even more grateful that people have actually said yes to doing this with me. I had no idea how far this podcast was going to go when I started it. So it's been really cool to see people enjoying all of these interviews. Tune in next time for more conversations on what goes into spacecraft design and development. If you've been enjoying this podcast, then follow The Art of Space Engineering on your favorite podcast platform to get notified about new episodes and share these episodes with your friends and other fellow space nerds. I'm going to go back to chipping away at my New Year's resolutions because I am determined to actually keep these consistent for more than a month or so, even though grad school is insanely busy and does not care that you have goals. Here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers, Sarah.